The story that you are about to hear is a compilation of documented true facts, featuring characters, events, or places that has played a role in shaping history. Please sit back and listen as I recite this narrative for you. With billions of dollars in diamonds changing hands every year, the Antwerp Diamond District in Belgium is one of the most heavily fortified sites in the world. On the 15th and 16th of February 2003, a heist of over 100 million in diamonds, as well as other jewels and gold, took place in Antwerp, Belgium. The outcome of the investigation into the significant jewelry heist is still a point of conflict. It was the largest diamond heist in history up until that point, and though arrests have been made, most of the diamonds stolen remain unrecovered. The crime took place over the course of a weekend in the Antwerp Diamond Center, which is located in the Gem District of Antwerp, Belgium. The stolen diamonds were kept in high-security vaults in safety deposit boxes. First of all, the vault was two levels underground. There were surveillance cameras and a private security force engaged by the corporation to keep an eye on everything. There was also a lock on the door that was virtually unbreakable with up to 100 million distinct combinations possible. Other detection devices in the area include Doppler radar, a seismic sensor, a magnetic field, and infrared heat detectors. Leonardo Notar Bartolo, the guy who was subsequently caught for the robbery, was able to get access to the property by renting office space in the same building. He rented that facility for about $700 a month and had been doing so for more than two years before the heist. As a result of renting office space in the building, he was able to gain access to the building 24 hours a day with a private ID card. Notar Bartolo pretended to be an Italian diamond merchant, which helped him acquire the trust of those who rented space in the building as well. The criminals were able to disguise their identities for a period of time after the heist because they also took off with the security footage that would have shown them during the robbery. There were 160 safety deposit boxes located inside of the vault made of steel and copper and had both a key lock and a combination lock, and 123 of them were forced open. 18 months of planning went into the robbery. The team, supposedly composed of five men and was led by Notar Bartolo, who was skilled in social manipulation, employed a variety of ingenious tactics to get past the security systems, leaving investigators baffled as to how they were able to get entry without setting off the alarms. When Notar Bartolo was arrested and interviewed, he gave his other team members aliases and refused to give up their real identity. Speedy was described as an anxious and paranoid man. He was a longtime friend of Notar Bartolo and was the one responsible for scattering the garbage in the woods. The monster was described as a tall, muscular man. He was apparently an expert lock picker, electrician, mechanic, and driver, and was very strong. The genius was a specialist in alarm systems. The king of keys was an older man. He was described as one of the best key forgers in the world. His true identity is unknown, and he remains the only member of the crew to escape apprehension by the police. The team performed extensive surveillance of the Diamond Center secretly photographing the center and the vault using camera pens. Under the pretext of being a diamond salesman, Notar Bartolo's regular visits led security to become accustomed to his presence and thus careless. They hid a small camera above the vault door, which was difficult to spot when the ceiling lights were turned on. It would record the combination used by guards who opened the door. It would then send its data to a sensor buried within an ordinary-looking red fire extinguisher in a nearby storage room in the center. The extinguisher was fully functional but had a watertight chamber hidden inside it which housed the electronics to receive the camera's data. They allegedly practiced with a full-scale copy of the vault which Notar Bartolo alleges was prepared with the help of a diamond trader insider. Then the day before the robbery, he visited the vault. He sprayed women's hairspray on the thermal motion sensors while inside. The oil in the product was transparent but would temporarily insulate the sensor from the thermal fluctuations in the room and the sensors would only go off if it detected both heat and motion. This could continue for several hours but not indefinitely. 
and the team employed it as a temporary measure until the sensor system could be properly disabled. While the security camera captured his acts, the guard was unconcerned because he was used to his visits. Notar Bartolo remained in a nearby getaway vehicle during the robbery, listening to a police scanner and prepared to leave as soon as the group was done. They also wore plastic gloves to avoid leaving fingerprints. The King of Keys picked the lock of an abandoned office building that adjoined Diamond Center as it shared a private garden with the Diamond Center that wasn't under video surveillance to evade the vast number of security cameras in the area around the bank. The team used a ladder to gain access to a tiny balcony in the center of the garden. The genius utilized a large homemade polyester shield to mask his thermal signature as he approached the sensor and placed the shield in front of it, preventing it from detecting the group. He then turned off the window alarms on the balcony. To allow the group to turn on the lights, security cameras in the antechamber were covered with black plastic bags. The vault door had a magnetic lock made of two plates that, when armed, would activate a magnetic field which would shatter when the door opened, triggering an alarm. The genius solved this problem by employing a custom-made aluminum plate with heavy-duty double-sided tape on one side. He then screwed the two bolts together with it. They were still side-by-side -side and generating a magnetic field even though they were out of their normal position. They were pivoted out of the way and taped to the antechamber wall. The King of Keys had successfully duplicated the nearly impossible to duplicate foot-long vault key using video footage. However, he was aware that guards frequently entered the utility room just before opening the door during the robbery and decided to investigate. He discovered the vault key inside the unlocked chamber. He chose to steal the original key because it would assure that the vault's manufacturers were unaware that the key could be replicated and the police would not know a duplicate had been manufactured until Notar Bartolo revealed it. The group turned off the anti-chamber lights before opening the vault door to avoid tripping light sensors in the vault. The monster moved to the middle of the room, reached up to the ceiling, and pushed aside a panel, locating the security system's inbound and outbound wires after the King of Keys picked the lock on the internal gate. If any sensor was tripped or broken, an electric pulse was sent along these wires causing the circuit to break and trigger the alarm. To overcome this, the monster carefully peeled the cable's plastic coating and soldered a new wire to the exposed copper wiring, rerouting the circuit and ensuring that the sensors would not raise the alarm if it was tripped. Styrofoam boxes were used to full heat sensors, while tape was used to blind light sensors. The men operated in the dark, having memorized the vault's layout. They'd turn on their lights for a few seconds every now and then to place their drill above the lock boxes. The King of Keys used a hand crank drill to break the locks on each of the security boxes. The contents were then emptied into duffel bags. They finished and left around 5.30 in the morning, then returned to the office building and proceeded with caution, which took them almost an hour to get to where Notar Bartolo was and place their bags into a couple of cars. On the way back, Speedy had a panic attack and made Notar Bartolo pull the car over. Soon, Speedy was throwing the evidence into the woods. After calming his friend down, they recovered most of the contents and sped off, but they didn't realize they were on private property, which belonged to August Van Camp, a Belgian hermit. He called the police because of the debris, which contained videotape films strung about, a half-eaten sandwich, dozens of small diamonds, envelopes from the Antwerp Diamond Center, and a receipt for a video surveillance system. It was enough evidence to link the crime to Notar Bartolo. The garbage evidence was enough for the cops to get a lead and they were eventually able to identify Notar Bartolo thanks to CCTV footage from a nearby grocery store where he had bought a sandwich. A receipt for the sandwich was amongst the garbage. The heist was organized by Notar Bartolo who was found guilty. He is thought to be the mastermind behind the crime which was carried out by a gang of Italian criminals known as the La Scuola di Torino or the School of Turin. In 2005, the Antwerp Court of Appeal sentenced him to 10 years in prison, although he was freed on parole in 2009. After he was discovered to have broken his parole conditions, a European arrest warrant was issued against him in 2011. 
One of these conditions was that he compensate the robbery victims, which he never attempted to do. As a result, he was arrested again in 2013 on a layover from the United States to Turin and was made to serve the remainder of his prison sentence until 2017. Although it seems like this is an open and shot case, there is an additional information that may point to a different outcome. Mr. Notar Bartolo does not deny that he was the one who committed the robbery. He did, however, allege that he was hired to take the jewels so that the corporation could make an insurance claim. Amazingly enough, however, there was not any insurance on the vault that was robbed, so this story does not carry much credibility. One thing is certain. Someone still owns a substantial amount of money in the form of diamonds, gold, and other valuable jewels. Despite the fact that the crime resulted in an arrest and conviction, the stolen items have never been found. This robbery, like many others, may have more to it than meets the eye. It is still considered by many people to be an unsolved crime, not only in the form of who did it, but also in what happened to the items that were stolen. Hey everyone, I just wanted to say that I am incredibly grateful that you took time out of your schedule to listen to my narration. This is Naki of Twisted Mind, wishing you a great rest of your day. Salamat.